The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome to the Women in Depth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Join me as we explore the inner lives of women, their struggles, fears, hopes, and dreams. We'll go beneath the surface and take a deeper look at what is hidden, unknown, uncertain, and uncomfortable. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. I am very excited today to welcome Bronwyn Schiffer, who is a colleague, friend, and psychotherapist from Madison, Wisconsin, who works with highly sensitive women struggling with depression. Bronwyn supports women who want to feel more strong, connected, and comfortable in their own skin. She has a master's of social work from Smith College School for Social Work and believes that personal transformation is what heals the world. Hi, Bronwyn, and welcome. Hi, Lourdes. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. I am really looking forward to talking with you today because this is a unique experience and challenge for those who are highly sensitive. And so I know that your perspective and your insights about this area is going to be really helpful for our listeners. So thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm excited to have the conversation. This is a question that I've asked many of my guests who are here on the podcast. I always need to go with the idea that this may be someone's first podcast ever, listening to anything about high sensitivity. And so I was wondering if you could start off by sharing, you know, what does it mean to be highly sensitive? I like to describe that as people who live and feel deeply. People with high sensitivity have look for a lot of meaning in their life. They really like to delve into the existential questions, often have a strong spiritual component of their life. They pause and think before taking actions, um, and they often feel really moved by the arts. Some might really like animals and feel really connected to nature. And the feeling deeply has a number of components, including um, having the gift of a lot of empathy, which includes being able to pick up on subtler things around them um, that other people may or may not pick up on as much, like how somebody else is feeling. Um, They might also feel responsible for helping other people since they know they can sense what people are feeling. And they tend to get overloaded or overstimulated more often because of too much stimulation around them. That can be being part of being with social in social activity for too long. Transition time is really important um, in between activities. New things can cause overstimulation, and even things like. Elaine Aaron, I was in, we reading some of her things recently, and she reminded me that things like being in the grocery store and having a lot of uh, decisions, like if there's a lot of ketchup brands to yes. choose from, <laughs> that that can be overstimulated. That's something that's yeah. a lot of information to process and can be more difficult for highly sensitive people. The other thing is any sensory things like noises, smells, textures that either are too much or just bothersome to highly sensitive people can be overstimulating as well, especially over a period of time. So that's kind of in a nutshell. There's really a lot of ways to, and it's as an innate trait that people are born with. It's all because of the way the brain is set up. And there's a lot of ways that it can manifest and look like for different people. And I'm always interested to hear how different people explain it because there are a lot of different lenses to look through and, and things to emphasize. Yeah, and I think too, um, along with what you're saying, Bronwyn, how the trait is experienced by a highly sensitive person can be very different person to person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's the test that Elaine Aaron has, quote unquote test, because really a brain scan is the only way to find out if you are highly sensitive. But the things that are associated with highly sensitive people are what is it, 24, 27 things. And so there can be a lot of variance within that. Yes. And if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about the trait itself, or you're interested in taking Elaine Aaron's quiz, or you're interested in the research, because this is a real thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's been a lot more research now than 
since Elaine Aaron first began her journey exploring this trait and sharing it with the world. But there's now a lot of research and 20% of the population has the trait and it's also found in animals. So if you're interested, um, I would check out Elaine Aaron's site, hsperson.com, which will be in the show notes. And you can also check out many of the previous episodes we've had because I want to say there's been probably eight or more episodes on high sensitivity where some of them really go into depth specifically about what are the four aspects of high sensitivity and how to really kind of dig down into what those are. So Bronwyn, I know that the the niche or the area that you work in is working with highly sensitive women who struggle with depression. And I was curious about how you were drawn into this work. Yeah, that's a good question. I myself am a highly sensitive person and so have um, a personal interest in that to be working with other people who are highly sensitive and, and helping them through that supporting them in that. And as a therapist, I really enjoy the long-term depth work. And that's a really good match for working with highly sensitive people because they really thrive in long-term deep therapy. They really like thinking about questions for a long time and thinking about, thinking really deeply about them. So it's a good match in that sense. And I really also enjoy helping support highly sensitive women really maximize the gifts that they bring as a highly sensitive person. With depression specifically, I will talk about this a little bit more too later, but there's a little bit of a more proneness almost, I feel like, to a lot of the things that people experience with depression mimic or mirror the things that can, the experiences of a highly sensitive person if they're depleted and not getting what they need as a highly sensitive person. So that intersection is is interesting to me. And I also really enjoy giving space to the hard spaces. I don't, and you know, I don't like that people are experiencing pain, but I think that it's important to offer a space that in the midst of a culture that, at least here in the U.S., that does not really provide a lot of space for sadness and grief and that kind of thing, that those things exist and they're telling us something and we need to move through them rather than just you know, shove them aside. So I think it's very important to offer a space for those kinds of things. So it's not just you're someone who's struggling with depression, but also seeing that there's value possibly or gifts or meaning in the depression. Yeah, definitely. That it can be useful in looking at what is it saying and and why is it here? Yeah, I love that. One of my mentors, James Hollis, he described symptoms because that's usually what people show up with, right? In our offices, they tell us all the symptoms that they're experiencing as messengers. Right. And it's about listening to the message Yeah, that our you know, anxiety, our depression is here to tell us something. And it's interesting because, you know, I agree with you that often there's this idea, you know, that let's stop feeling depressed or anxious as quickly as we can. And I laugh because I see things all the time, like, you know, 10 steps to being happy, right? Or do these three things and you won't be anxious anymore. And there's a very strong messaging in our culture about needing to be strong, needing to be happy, needing to be productive. And so I think that it's so important, not just actually for HSPs, but for everyone to feel that these experiences are just part of being human and there's nothing wrong with them. And there's even value. Absolutely. I love what you said about this intersection between the trait of high sensitivity and when someone who is highly sensitive is depleted and how that can mimic symptoms of depression. So I think this would be a good place to kind of segue into what is depression Mm -hmm. and how does it show up for the highly sensitive person? Yeah, I think first I'll I'll just kind of go over a little bit some descriptors of depression because I th- of depression in general and then kind of talk about highly sensitive people are impacted um, specifically with those experiences because I think sometimes people don't often recognize the things that might be considered quote unquote depression 
they might think that, oh, you know, I'm not crying all the time, so I'm not depressed. But there's a lot of different ways that it can manifest. And so I'll just start by kind of naming some of those experiences that people might have when they're feeling uh, or experiencing some depression. Not having any energy is a big one. Being really tired all the time, not getting enough sleep, either not being able to sleep or even if you are sleeping, not feeling rested and just really wanting to be in bed as much as possible. Along with that, it can be literally hard to move, like feeling like you're walking through water or like your limbs are just very heavy, or even that your entire self is just kind of weighted down if an experience of feeling heavy, feeling foggy or fuzzy, like your brain is foggy, your brain is fuzzy, feeling suffocated. I said the word depleted before, that's a big one that shows up. Feelings of isolation, feeling really alone and lonely, empty, flat, unfulfilled, not having the connection that you might long for, not feeling like you belong anywhere, feeling invalidated. Some people have the experience, you know, when you're underwater and you can kind of hear things around you, but it's an echoey chamber and, and not quite connected. It's, that's kind of a metaphor that people sometimes use. And feeling really fragile is another one, like almost like you might be a piece of glass and might shatter with anything going wrong. Feeling powerless feeling angry, irritated, blaming yourself, hating yourself, blaming other people, feeling resentful and ruminating. It's another kind of hallmark of, is like to be depressed of kind of that negative spiral of thinking of just thinking about everything that's wrong in the world and wrong with your life and wrong with you and, and just not being able to get out of that. Ronwin, I'm really glad that you brought up all of these other ways that depression can be experienced and how it can feel and feel like in the body. And also these metaphors or visuals, like I really liked the one about the feeling fragile, like a piece of glass. Mm. And again, this is so important because I think many might feel that if I'm depressed, I just have to be really, really sad. Mm -hmm. And you can be depressed and not feel sad. Mm -hmm. in the sense that maybe you are actually really irritated with everyone or you just feel exhausted until you think I'm just tired, I'm stressed out. And so it can be a little, you know, difficult to kind of tease out that it's, it, that it's actually depression. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I think oftentimes people will say that they didn't they weren't the first ones to notice that they were depressed. It was a it was a family member or another loved one who said, "You seem kind of off. You don't seem like yourself." And so I think that's another indescribable but but something that depression in a way can kind of creep up on you in that sense of, you know, the changes might be so subtle even for highly sensitive people that not noticing right away and then maybe later you haven't return my calls or, you know, you used to do the dishes every night and now they're piling up or just forgetting things or, um, yeah, that, that you might not notice. And then if somebody else points it out, then it, it might kind of click. Yeah. So Bronwyn, when we look at these examples of how a highly sensitive person might experience depression or how maybe they're perceived by those close to them, how can some of these experiences or feelings actually mimic the trait versus being a symptom of depression? That's a really good question. And the ways that I see that intersection is most in the, well, first of all, the rumination and also what can happen if you're not getting what you need as a high, like physiologically, if you're not getting what you need as a highly sensitive person, if there's too much overstimulation and then over time that just depletion, that word again is, I think, just really apt that if you're not getting enough downtime, if you're not able to rejuvenate or calm yourself after being overstimulated, then that can look like depression, that, that can look like being depleted. And the rumination also is something that highly sensitive people kind of do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the overthinking, yeah. Yes, yes. just, I mean, they, they <laughs> some, you know, in, in some senses, it's, it's fabulous, you know, just going off and thinking about all these things. And, you know, so it can be really positive to just kind of ponder things. And if it's on a negative spiral, then that can also then mimic depression too. Especially, I think, because and this is another part of the intersection, is that 
the deep capacity for empathy that highly sensitive people have, they are going to feel the pain of themselves, of the people around them that they love, and of the world in general. They're going to feel that more intensely. So that can sometimes, for therapists too, might kind of mistake that. Like if there's a great amount of pain experienced for the world or for other people or even their own, could be seen like a depression when it might not be. It might just be that that's because they're highly sensitive and they feel things, as I said earlier, more deeply. That's just part of who they are. What you were saying, Bronwyn, reminded me too of, you know, one of the differences with an HSP brain comes down to the mirror neurons. There are more mirror neurons and mirror neurons do exactly what they say. They mirror whatever is happening outside of the highly sensitive person. So if someone else is very anxious, the highly sensitive person will literally feel that anxiety themselves. Yes. If someone outside of them is very angry, they're going to feel what it feels like to have that anger also. And so, you know, just with what's happening in their lives, out in their community, out in the world, that's a lot for one person to take in. And so if you're, you can see how that could very easily become something like depression. Yeah, I think about when I used, I before I became a therapist, I was working in an after school art center and it was in the basement of this building. It was a wonderful after school art center and we our desks were like less than two feet from each other in this small basement building. Yeah. And even with our backs were to each other, but whatever, I, it was, I remember that it was often really hard for me to concentrate because I would be like, oh, my boss is upset or, oh, the person next to me is upset. <laughs> so... <laughs> Also, highly sensitive persons experience joy, excitement. They're moved by mm -hmm. beauty, by nature, by the arts. And the flip side of that is, you know, they also are deeply moved and feel deeply all of the more challenging experiences of being human. Mm -hmm. To talk about the how does a highly sensitive person, you know, how does that affect depression? I would say like the same but amplified so all of those things that we just talked about of all the experiences, they're yeah. going to have those experiences and they're, they're going to be amplified. Yes, even more intense and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not just with the rumination, I feel like you were just saying with the mirror neurons, the fact that literally they are feeling things from other people that when you're in a, when, when, you know, if there is a clinical depression, if there is something going on that, that you're experiencing a lot of those things that we just mentioned, that it's going to be really hard to disengage yeah. from feeling, you know, from those mirror neurons taking over and getting swept away by everything that's around you. And I think too, it's, it's difficult because of the mirror neurons and the strong empathy and the deep feeling for the highly sensitive person to be able to discern and then kind of untangle themselves from maybe another person's depression or anxiety mm -hmm. to be able to even tell that, okay, this isn't mine. Exactly. Because it feels like it's mine. <laughs> right, right. Because I'm literally feeling it. <laughs> yeah. So, so that also becomes, I think, a real challenge. And I hear this with them. Um, you know, some of my clients where maybe their husband is very anxious. Mm -hmm. And so now they feel very anxious mm -hmm. and are wondering, am I developing anxiety or do I have anxiety? And being able to kind of tease that out. Is it your mirror neurons mirroring what's happening with your husband? Or is this your own anxiety or is it both? <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's no small task. No, it's not. This is a really good segue into when someone is highly sensitive and dealing with depression or has what appears to be depressive symptoms. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What's unique or different about the healing slash recovery process? Mm -hmm. I see really four pieces of that, that if it is something like a clinical depression, and actually, even if it's not, I mean, it, sometimes that line between what is what are these things because I'm highly sensitive and what are these things because it's a clinical depression? I think that there's so much overlap that I don't want anybody who might be wondering about that to have that be another barrier to getting some support in this, yeah. that finding a good therapist to kind of just suss any of that out is going to be really important. If any of the things that we just talked about, those experiences are, are resonating with anyone, that that is an important piece to have that space. And I just want to jump in and also make the case for why it's so important 
when seeking support that your therapist is either highly sensitive themselves or aware and informed with this trait and what it means? Absolutely. I actually um, have a blog post about how to find a good therapist because I think that for anyone in a space of feeling depressed, it's going to be hard to find a therapist. And there's a lot of hurdles to overcome, whether it's whether they take your insurance or whether you like them or, you know, are they in your area or then your state, that kind of thing. And you don't have a lot of energy, as we just (laughs) said, when you're depressed. And so, and that takes a lot of energy. So, and yes, it is really important. You know, the research shows that over half of how therapy is helpful is if you feel comfortable with your therapist. And that's something that I wanted to highlight too, that in addition to them understanding, and as you said, that it is important for your therapist to understand what the highly sensitive trait is because, and this is just one example, but if I, as a therapist, am working with a client who experiences difficulty with being around people for a long time, I might think of that as a social anxiety, for example, like, oh, well, what, you know, let's just work on what makes you anxious around people, which is something that it can look, the high sensitive, highly sensitive trait can look like because of the overstimulation that we were talking about before, that high sensitive people love being around other people. They just can't do it maybe for as long. Like they can't go to a museum all day long and then go out to a, a bar that night. Like they need it in smaller doses. And so things like that can get misinterpreted and misunderstood by therapists. And so it's important to know that For example, that wouldn't be social anxiety. We're not going to work on how can you feel more comfortable with people. We're going to work on how are you going to be getting more downtime and not be feeling as depleted. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really good example, Ronwin. And I, you know, I what I I find helpful for myself when I'm feeling anxious or depressed or any of that, or you know, when I beginning to work with a highly sensitive person is, you know, really let's look at lifestyle first because. It's interesting once you start to dial that in and and start to teach the highly sensitive person how to manage their trait. I think once they start to do that and put those in place and you see what's left, you know, so after you are now aware that you need more transition time or after you are now aware of not multitasking or having too many things on your schedule and you're now structuring or creating a life that supports your trait it's interesting to see. So, so how, what is left? Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that kind of helps suss out the, what is the HSP piece and what is yeah. the depression piece? Right. And I, I don't know if, you, if you've come across this, but I've worked with a lot of clients who were, you know, who worked with wonderful therapists, but who maybe these therapists weren't aware of the trait or psychiatrists who weren't aware of the trait. And I, I've had clients who were misdiagnosed with bipolar mm. or ADHD or they were given the standard treatment for social anxiety, which is exposure therapy right? <laughs> and CBT. And so nothing against those. You know, those are modalities that work for certain populations. But for highly sensitive persons, it doesn't support the trait or it doesn't have the trait in mind as part of the treatment. Exactly. And especially for the going back to the anxiety, social anxiety example, like if you're giving exposure therapy, that's going to make it much worse. (laughs) (laughs) It is. Which can also be really defeating for the highly sensitive client who is trying to get help with these things. And then, oh, well, you know, even therapy didn't work. So now what do I do? Mm -hmm. So yes, I absolutely underscore that it's important to find a therapist who has some kind of understanding of what that is and Elaine Aaron has a directory actually on her website of of therapists to start from. So I think that's a really important place to start. And I also think that it's important to note for highly sensitive people when looking for therapists, that it's okay to say this person is not a good match, that it's really that, you know, Elaine Aaron talks about this in her highly sensitive person workbook that you're shopping around for a therapist and it's you who are making the you are making the decision of of what's going to be the best for what you need and so it's not rude to say it doesn't feel like I'm going to be comfortable with you or, or you know whatever you don't have to justify yourself highly sensitive people have really good intuition so tr- trusting your own intuition on that and taking the time to through consultation calls through even one or more sessions to say 
is this somebody that I think is going to, that I'm going to feel comfortable enough and who's going to be able to understand what I'm going through in order to, to make the investment of, of time and money that going to therapy is. And I just want to add to that too, that for highly sensitive persons, they can do really well in therapy. Absolutely. And so have that be your motivation to really take the time and do the research and say, no, this isn't working if needed to find the therapist that works for you. Because if you can do that, that is just such a predictor for therapy, having a positive outcome for you. Absolutely. No, thanks for for bringing that up because there's two sides to the same coin that when you were talking about the positive emotions and negative emotions being amplified, that high sensitive people thrive more in therapy than non-highly sensitive people, which is why it's important, I think, for all therapists to understand at least that this is a trait. Because again, the research also says that up to 40 to 50% of people in therapy are actually highly sensitive. Yes. I remember when I first discovered the trait and I looked at my clients and kind of did like an informal inventory of who I thought was highly sensitive. And it was definitely at least 50%. And so every therapist out there, whether they're highly sensitive or not, at least half of their clients are probably highly sensitive. Right. So Bronwyn, if someone's listening and this is resonating for them, and perhaps, you know, especially if they're dealing with depression, it's hard to feel hopeful or motivated to find the energy for that. What can you offer in terms of hope as far as recovering from depression? Well, first of all, that there is hope that I think that often there's a really strong experience of invalidation that happens for highly sensitive people in general, invalidating that their experience isn't real, that like the things that they experience as having the trade isn't real, like, oh, that pebble in your shoe actually isn't bothering you. (laughs) Yeah. And especially with depression then too, that people who are anyone who's experiencing depression highly sensitive or not, could also be invalidated by people saying, oh, just cheer up, you know, eat more vegetables and take more walks, you know, (laughs) some kind of (laughs) simple solution that does not get at the depth of what that person is experiencing. And if you're not able to find the right support, it can feel like, well, gosh, is everyone right? Like, do I just have to suck it up, really? (laughs) Right, right. And I don't want to do that because that's intolerable. And that can just lead to a cycle of despair and hopelessness. So to say there is hope and absolutely there, you know, for both being highly sensitive and experiencing depression with that. So in addition to finding a good therapist, I would say that there are three other things that would be important. First, claiming your highly sensitive self and the specific needs that it has, which I also just want to note is not an automatic process. There are a lot of people who say it's very common to hear, oh, when I found out about the highly sensitive trait, I was really relieved. Such a relief to know that this is a real thing and that I can have resources for it. And that's a true experience. And it's also a true experience to be ambivalent about it because there's a lot of baggage with the word sensitive. And there are some people who are not quite so sure about how they feel about being highly sensitive. (laughs) And so just to normalize that and say that's also a completely valid experience too. And that, you know, if that is your experience, you know, as working through that, that at least checking out what the resources are and, and trying them on can be really helpful because some people also say, like you said before, once you get the highly sensitive needs taken care of, then there may not be as much depression as you initially thought. Yeah. And it's easier to manage regardless. So there's lots of resources for learning more about what you need as a highly sensitive person or what you might need and, you know, kind of the framework for that. There's Elaine Aaron's workbook. You've had people like April Snow and Julie Balland on here who have talked more about specifically, like what is in that you referenced earlier, like what is an HSP and what do they need? I'm just going to highlight a few of those needs that... I think are important, like I've mentioned downtime, that HSPs need more downtime than other people, like up to two hours a day, and that being where your brain is not active. So kind of daydreaming is a prescription. (laughs) And, you know, I think that's another thing, like going back to why I think it's important for someone to, number one, be aware of this trait if they have it, and number two, to work with a therapist who also understands this because you might think, what's wrong with me? I can't get anything done. I'm just spacing out. Right. 
And really, you're not. You're actually, you're, you're intuitively moving towards what you need, which is some downtime. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And more sleep. And more sleep, yes. Highly sensitive people need eight to 10 hours, which I have friends who get away with six, and I'm like, what I would do with four more hours in the day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which also, it can feel like that, but really that's kind of the tendency, but I have to remind myself that no, I actually get a lot done when I get those eight to 10 hours of sleep. Yeah. So I can pack it in there, you know, when I am, when I'm feeling well rested and when I'm getting what I'm needing to. So. And I think this kind of piggybacks again on, you know, what we were talking about, how, you know, the negative and the positive that, and then on the flip side for a highly sensitive person to not get enough sleep, Mm -hmm. it's harder on us than it is on someone who's not highly sensitive. (laughs) Absolutely. We're going to notice it more. Definitely. A couple other things just to mention with the HSP needs are getting practice, not just saying no to things that you don't want to do, but saying no to things that are too close together, like not lining yourself up to do things five nights a week. So you're not overextending yourself. So being aware of schedule in that way. And then talking about the, the empathy and those mirror neurons and kind of what you were talking about earlier of what's mine and what's somebody else's that I'm picking up on. I really like, I don't know if you're familiar with Donna Eden and all of her energy work. Oh, I'm not. She's an energy healer, I think is probably what she calls herself. And if you look her up on on YouTube, she's just as a warning. She's a little over the top, very, very happy. So especially if you're in a (laughs) a place of feeling depressed, it can be kind of a shock and maybe, (laughs) maybe not what you're looking for. But if you can kind of set that piece of it aside, she has a lot of really good exercises to do. And I really like the, she calls it the heaven and earth one. And that's a really good grounding exercise that I like to do. And that people have found helpful that just puts you more in touch with your own senses and literally grounds you. And also she has one called the zip up. That is a nice concrete way. You just kind of put your hand, like if you put your hands next to each other and join the pointer fingers and the thumbs to make a triangle, and then just kind of start at your belly button and literally just go up your, the the midline at up to your mouth and then make a little like lock the key motion. Uh-huh. She calls it the zip up. And it's it's literally to keep out other people's energy and, and keep your energy protected. And that's, as we've talked about, is very important for highly sensitive people. Another thing that's really important is finding out what is comforting to you after you're overwhelmed. Because as we said, the ketchup aisle is something <laughs> that can overwhelm you. So it's going to happen. Like we're going to be overstimulated and um, as highly sensitive people. And so not only getting the downtime, but also figuring out and getting really clear on what is nourishing for you and what's comforting for you after you may have been overstimulated. Sometimes that's just closing your eyes. Sometimes that's going in a dark room. I also like the butterfly hug that is actually from EMDR treatment, but can be really helpful in a lot of other ways. And there's one specifically that um, is on YouTube that just goes through it really well and really, um, thoroughly and also gives a lot of choice in how you kind of play it out. So those are just a few of the many things that that highly sensitive people have that are different needs just to kind of start with. Yeah. And from that, I think it's really important. I was actually really excited you had not too long ago talked with Carly Randolph Pittman about yeah. nourishing ourselves and and disordered eating and things and I was so excited when she said, asked the question like ask yourself what do you need? Because that's exactly, I have a blog post kind of about that too, actually, that first there's a specific to highly sensitive people, you know, there's this framework of you need more downtime. So, okay, how much downtime do you need and when do you get it and how do you get it? But it's also just a really fundamental question of what do we need and going back to the messenger, like you were saying, depression, you know, things that we're experiencing as messenger, what are they saying to us and what are they saying that we need, which can change day to day, can change, you know, over the course of your lifetime, but is a really central question. I think especially for both for women and for highly sensitive people, because at least in this patriarchal culture that we're in here in the United States that really discourages women from acknowledging that they have needs and and making them feel like they're selfish for acknowledging that or or getting their needs met and for highly sensitive people who because they have this ability and capacity to take in other people's emotions that what comes with that can be this feeling of responsibility to take care of that which is a great gift in some sense but also requires some 
discernment in, you know, again, what's mine and what's not mine and what is my responsibility and what's not my responsibility. Yeah. So I, I really like that question of just asking yourself, what do you need right now? What do you need in your job? What do you need in your family relationships? What do you need in your life that, that also really matches well with highly sensitive people's love for meeting and looking for the, you know, the deep questions. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, if you can answer those deep questions or at least explore them, um, the answers are, I think, what helps sustain us through the difficult times, the challenging times. And so I am all for, I'm a big proponent for doing that search for meaning, the values exploration. And I think that that's something that highly sensitive persons are just naturally drawn to and enjoy and really benefit from knowing. Mm -hmm. And I think too, the more that you do that, I mean, it can, especially when you're feeling depressed, it can feel a little bit daunting. Like I have no idea what I need, or maybe you have never thought about what it is that you need. And it could be as simple as I need a glass of orange juice, (laughs) or it could be as complex as I am not in a relationship that I want to be in, or I'm not in the job that I want to be in. But over time, kind of having, practice that question over and over just helps you get more and more clear. And so also with the things that you would, you know, experiencing any kind of depression, you can become familiar with, Oh, I know that feeling that's depletion. And I know what I need to do for that. I need to go take a hot bath or listen to this piece of music or whatever it is. And so being able to catch the messages or, you know, the messages or the symptoms or whatever we're calling them faster so that they don't spin out of control as much over time. Yeah. And I think too, that um, with a highly sensitive person's being so conscientious and wanting to do the right thing and do things right, it's even more important to be very discerning again about what is going on with me. Is it this? Is it that? Is it mine? Is it others? Because again, with this aspect of the highly sensitive person wanting to do the right thing, wanting to do things well. It's a slippery slope to shame and despair. Absolutely. What are your words of wisdom to a listener who is feeling that perhaps what's happening with them is depression and or there's the trait of high sensitivity that needs to kind of be sussed out a little bit? I would say that there's nothing wrong with you for having any of those experiences, like your experiences, your experience and being sensitive or being depressed is not weak, that there's a lot of benefit in being able to talk back to that, to any kind of voices that have said that, why do those dryer sheets bother you so much? (laughs) You should should really like, I don't care about that dryer sheet, (laughs) but that it is a real thing and that you are bothered by that and that's okay. And you can, that it's really possible to move toward an environment that's more conducive to what are the things that you need. Um, and that there are a lot of benefits to being a high sensitive person that, as you said before, that high sensitive people experience joy more. They, it's not just the negative things. It's not just the difficult pain and anguish that they feel more keenly. It's the, it's the joy and the euphoria and the excitement and the delight that is also amplified. And that's really amazing. It truly is. And When you are taking care of your highly sensitive self, it'll be more clear to you. I think that you'll be able to have this insight into what is really going on for you and to what extent. Once you, again, if you can understand how the trait shows up for you and you can begin to nurture yourself with this trait in mind, it brings a lot of clarity and I think normalizes things, validates, offers hope. Like you said, there's a lot of positives with this. Mm -hmm. So Bronwyn, what's the best way for listeners to learn more about you or get in touch with you? They could go to my website, which is kind of a mouthful, but (laughs) the link is probably easy to, it's it's my full name, bronwynschiffertherapy.com. We'll make sure to include that in the show notes along with any of the resources or references that you mentioned. And I believe you have a blog post that you'll be including also. Is that the one on finding a therapist? Yeah, there might be two. There's two actually, because there's one on finding a therapist and one about the, you know, ask yourself what it is that you need and kind of just reflecting on that as a practice. And we'll make sure, like I said, to include those links in the show notes. And Bronwyn, thank you again for spending time with me today and having this conversation. 
I enjoyed it very much, and um, it's very helpful for me, too, in my work with my clients. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about this. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to the Women in Depth podcast. I hope it brings you a deeper understanding of yourself and others, and that you found some insights that illuminated and inspired. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting Women in Depth with a one-time or recurring donation. Any amount is appreciated and helps us continue to provide free, quality content for the world. If donating resonates with you, you can find the donation link on today's show notes. You can also follow Women in Depth on Facebook and YouTube. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe on iTunes. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.